And so last week we spoke about discerning good from false prophecy, admitting, you know, just looking at when we get things wrong, particularly in the power gifts, that we need to admit that we get them wrong. And as I was driving home, I had a thought, and I was like, man, why didn't I say that? So I get to say it today, because we have 52 of these Sundays. Um, But in the Old Testament, if you got it wrong, others stoned you. Um, because that's how serious it was to misrepresent God. In the New Testament, nobody should ever stone you, but we should die to ourselves. And this is the New Testament posture. And part of the way that we die to ourselves is by confession, admitting when we get things wrong. Um, Because when we don't admit when we get things wrong, we don't only do damage here, we do damage here. And that's what we looked at last week. And so this week, I want to do some of my best work around the area of spiritual leadership. And um, I've learned it on, in, in terms of following Jesus, I also am you know, taught and led through this thing called Leader Breakthrough, and I'm going to use some of their language today. But as we round Deuteronomy, we are entering a really exciting part of the biblical story of redemption. It also highlights a church-wide challenge that we are facing across Canada today, and it is this, that too few Christians actually finish well. Every single Christian starts well, but they don't finish well. Um, I don't know if you know this, but only three out of 10 Christians finish well. Um, that is not okay. That means seven out of 10 followers of Jesus, if there's 10 of us who start following Jesus at the, at the same time, only three finish well. This is a spiritual battle that we are in, Uh, It is contested space. Every time that you want to take a step forward, you will experience spiritual pushback. And so what I want to do today is I don't want to give you any keys. I don't want to give you any steps. And I don't want to give you any ladders. I don't want to give you any of that stuff. What I want you to see are postures. How, when God works in us, what it looks like, what it feels like on the outside and, and how we can respond to it. And so under the context of that, and I'm also using the word leader quite broadly, and here is why. When I use the word leader, some of you automatically disqualified yourself. Don't do that. Do not do that. Because every Christian leads, and here is why. Every one of us is called by God to use our lives to help others either begin or continue following Jesus. In the context of a local church, this is called discipleship. This is called communal discipleship. So you may not have a spiritual gift of leadership. You may not have the natural abilities of a leader. You may not have the position of a leader. But every one of you has influence. Every one of you speaks words. Every single one of you can encourage somebody or discourage somebody. Every single one of you can inspire somebody or you can spew on someone where they get stuck. Every one of us has influence that we steward Well, Jesus gave us all a command, his followers, to make disciples. Notice the word is to make them, all right? That is a process, and it's equally given to all of us. That is not just for a few. He didn't just give it to those who are kind of in Ephesians 4.11, spiritual work of ministry. He gave this to all of us. It means that we have to steward the influence. Everyone just whisper influence. We have to steward the influence God gives us that flows from spiritual authority, from, that flows from spiritual authority. When Jesus taught, people were like amazed. I, I should never use the word like. I felt like a valley girl right there. <laughs> when Jesus taught, people were amazed because of one thing. He taught as one who had authority. And then the contrast was not as the teachers of the law. So what is authority? Well, it's a really, really big word that the root word of it or the prefix of it, of course, is the word author, okay? And so Jesus is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. John chapter one, John says to describe Jesus that he is the word who became flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So everything that the word is saying in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now we're in Deuteronomy, as Jesus begins to teach, they are amazed because the author is speaking, The author of all of it is speaking, and therefore, the religious leaders, they were interpreters trying to figure out what the author meant, but here is the author saying it, and they are, wow, they are moved by it. So spiritual authority is the right to control, govern. It's about dominion. It's a sphere of jurisdiction, and here the author is doing this. But here's what I want you to understand. 
It's that spiritual authority is the influence that God grants a leader. This is Terry Walling. And it is something in which every leader, every Christian, must participate. Spiritual authority is the byproduct of a life of intimacy and dependency on Christ. In other words, spiritual authority is not just a position. It is something that we must grow in stewarding well. Spiritual authority is not produced. It is not gained. It is not self-promotion. It is not position. I don't care how any loud somebody shouts. I don't care how many titles are in front of their name. That does not equate spiritual authority at all. Spiritual authority is rooted in all of us developing Christ-like character, stewarding which we have received as a gift from God. For me as the man or the head of my home, I understood authority in this way. Just I'm going to drop some breadcrumbs and I'm going to keep going. I often was uncomfortable with the word authority because it always felt like I have to be over or out in front until I saw Jesus. And I looked at Jesus and I saw him, as Pastor Lori just said during communion, that he was the first to wash the disciples' feet. When you know your authority in Christ, you are the first one to serve. So my role in the house is not to be the spiritual know-it-all. My role in my home is to be the first one to serve. When things go wrong, it is my honor to be the one who forgives first. It is my honor to wash feet. When I am tense with what my kids are doing, it is my honor to show them the love of God, not to have lordship over them. I am the first one to go low to wash feet, spiritual authority. We don't understand this in our culture. We think it's CEO. It is not. It is Jesus Christ. He left heaven and came to earth low. So let's dig in today. I hope every one of us as followers of Jesus desire to hear Jesus one day say to them, well done, good and faithful. Low, low. Low. Well done, good and faithful servant. I hope you have that as your aim. And here is our current challenge, which Moses is facing at the end of Deuteronomy. We need more Christians to finish well, to accomplish what God has entrusted us with. Moses is in Deuteronomy. He's giving the sermon to the next generation who are about to step into the promised land. He's not going to step into the promised land. Through his disobedience, he's not going to see the promised land. However, he's a good leader. He wants his failure not to define their future. He wants them still to learn from his failure and to step into the promised land. Moses is a interesting leader and like all of us. So I'll give you a bit of context and then we're going to get going here. To finish well, to steward influence on others well, we have to be aware of four postures we take to allow the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. And they are surrender, alignment, brokenness, and vulnerability. I'm going to talk to you about those four things today and kind of this recap as Deuteronomy winds down and we're going to get into the book of Joshua. Each posture is how we grow and how we steward spiritual authority. And Exodus starts with an intergenerational story, uh, story of good and evil. So a little recap here, and then we're going to really dig in. Israel, at this point, is just a person. And his family go to Egypt during a famine and receive provision from their son that they thought was lost, Joseph. His son they thought was lost, Joseph. Joseph has risen to be the second in command, and this is all good. God sent Joseph ahead to bring provision, not only to Egypt, but to Israel. And later, a new pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph sees the children of Israel, so the children of Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, multiplying in number. He sees them as a threat and not a blessing. The pharaoh of Egypt is the picture of unholy authority. It is living active in rebellion to who God is. And so rather than seeing people as a blessing, he sees them as a threat to be annihilated. And so he first enslaves them, Pharaoh does, and then he sends out a decree that all Hebrew baby boys should be killed. It was then and it is today. This is the work of evil. So I want to take a minute and pause here as well on this November 3rd, and we're going to pray, because did you know that there are 365 million brothers and sisters in Christ right now all around the world who are persecuted simply because they are following Jesus for no other reason? 365 million brothers and sisters, that is almost 10 times the size of our nation. 
persecuted just because they are following Jesus. The number one persecuted country in the world is North Korea. And then you, if, you go, if you went to Voice of, the Martyrs Can, Voice of the Martyrs Canada or VOM Canada, it is an amazing website that you can actually have your heart touched. And the focus this year as we pray for the persecuted church is also to pray specifically for the female followers of Jesus, who when they are persecuted, 9.9 times out of 10, they are also sexually violated. And so we need to pray for them. So let's do it. Heavenly Father, as we sit in freedom, that, yeah, it is contested. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters all around the world who just because they say Jesus is my Savior and Lord, the pharaohs of our day do the same thing as the pharaoh of this day, seeks to enslave them and to end their lives. Father, we pray that you would strengthen and encourage them. Lord, we pray that you would sustain them. Father, we also pray that you would break the back of just utter rebellion against you in our world. Jesus, we long for the day when we no longer have to pray for a persecuted church. We long for the day where you will wipe every single tear from our eye. But we live in this day, which there is still pain and brokenness. And so, Jesus, would you move by your power? Would you move by your grace? And would you do what only you can do as we lift up our brothers and sisters before you? And everybody said, amen. amen. And so like, <clears throat> like our story in Christ, the story of Moses actually begins with rescue and salvation. I want you to see it really clearly. Moses is under a death sentence. I just said it. That Pharaoh has decreed that all Hebrew baby boys be murdered. And Moses is just a baby. And so he's under a death sentence. He is utterly powerless, but through the actions of another, he is rescued, he is redeemed, he is saved. Can you see the thread of redemption all the way through the story that is leading to Jesus? God's grand redemption story is unfolding, and the story of Moses is tied to the stories of Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, who are all tied to Yahweh. And this leads us to our first posture that I want you to hear with both ears in your whole heart. The very first posture that you need to embrace and what it feels like to become more like Jesus is what we sang during worship. I surrender all. And that is posture number one, is surrender. Surrender. Our story doesn't start with us, so it shouldn't be about us. The first posture for you to follow Jesus is the posture of surrender. I can't save myself. I can't fix myself. I can't heal myself. I am not God. There is a God that is greater than me. And so I surrender. I come under. I receive what I can't earn on my own. It is this posture of surrender. If you look all around the world today, when God begins to move on someone's life for the very first time for them to be followers of Jesus, the initial battle that they face is the battle of surrender. It is their will, their desires. It is, does it mean this? Does it mean that? And all of this stirs on the inside and all of this stirs on the outside. And we as Christ followers are called to pray for those who do not yet know Jesus, that the God of this world who has blinded their eyes so that, that they cannot see, that they will begin to see. But when they begin to see, it kicks off a battle of surrender. When they begin to see is when the battle of surrender starts because when they can't see, there is no surrender. There's this yielding to what it is that I want to do. But the moment that you and I say yes to follow Jesus, now we are entering a battle of surrender. Now you enter a battle of wills, my will or the will of the Father. We be, this begins to wrestle on the inside of us. And I also want to let you know that all of these postures, by the way, they are not static. They are dynamic in the sense that you can enter two of them simultaneously or be in this one and spring to that one. And here's what else I want you to know. It's such a word of encouragement this morning. You never graduate from surrender. <laughs> That if God wants to take you to a deeper place in him, to, to have you steward more spiritual authority, you're going to find yourself at a place of surrender again. You're going to find yourself at a battle of wills again. You're going to find yourself in a place where it's like, I don't want to forgive. I don't want to give. I don't want to serve. I don't want to. Yeah, surrender. It's a battle of wills. God is actually trying to make you more like Jesus, but it feels like he's killing you. Because he is. 
Not, not the good parts of you, the parts of your flesh that need to die. Because if they don't die, they're not dead. <laughs> and if they're not dead, if they're not dead, they have the power to become Lord again. Wow. All of our lives. Surrender, okay? Surrender is the opposite to our desire for one thing, which is control. It is where we answer, who is the true king of my heart? This is the path of surrender. And again, like I just said, like all postures, all of them, surrender is dynamic, it's not static. Surrendering to Jesus is a settled decision that is managed daily. Moses meets with God, and God leads him to choose between surrender or control. God brings him to a place of decision. Will, my, will his story be about God, Yahweh, or will it be about him? Let's read in Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off the feet, off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Once again, wherever God is, is holy. It is separate. It is different. It is distinct from anywhere else in the world. Though he is omnipresence, when his manifest presence shows up, it changes things. Things happen. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then it says, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. That's the proper fear, not an unholy fear. This is Moses realizing that God doesn't just show up for nothing. He's here for a reason. He's calling him for a purpose. He's not just showing up to like show off that God is not prideful in any way. God does not need anything. He doesn't have to prove anything. Everything he does has a reason and a purpose. And Moses can understand this. And as soon as he understands, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob, Moses is culturally Egyptian, but he is ethnically Hebrew. He knows the stories. He knows when God showed up to Abraham what that meant. He knows what happened to Isaac, and he knows the story of Jacob. So he knows, "Uh uh-oh, this is a surrender moment. Now, nestled within this story is also our next posture, and here's the posture. The posture is alignment. Everybody say alignment. Alignment. So let's say you surrender to God. Amazing. Is the journey over? No, no, it's just begun. Then the next story is alignment. The alignment posture is the outflow of a life genuinely surrendered to Jesus. Not my will, your be done. God, what do you want me to do today? Lord, my time is not my own. It is, it's, it's your time. I am no longer the master of my life. I am the servant of Jesus. And so, Lord, how do you desire to use my life in service today? It's the posture of alignment. And this is a daily static battle all of our lives. It's the outflow. For Moses, this meant trusting that God was king, that Pharaoh was not king. As a cultural Egyptian, he would have grown up that Pharaoh is king. Pharaoh is king. Pharaoh is authority. Pharaoh is final authority. Now he meets God and he realizes there is one that is greater than Pharaoh. He knows it. And embracing this truth, then he aligns his life to let God use him and his influence to lead God's people out of Egypt. And I want you to hear this. It's really, really beautiful in Exodus chapter 3. Listen to the wrestle of alignment as Moses speaks and asks God an honest question, but an incorrect question. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. This is God speaking. And I have also seen the oppression of which the Egypts oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And so God says, I will send you and I'm going to bring you to Pharaoh. But Moses said to God, this is what God says. And now listen to what Moses says. Who am I? Who am I? This is what he says. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Notice Moses gets it half right. He says in this moment, who am I that I should go to lead the children of Israel out of Pharaoh? He totally omits what God said God was going to do. So alignment is always, we hear from something, God asks us to do something, and then we immediately forget what God is going to do because we fixate on what he's asking us to do. Hey, I want you to begin to serve, but my time is my time. Hey, I want to use your life to influence the next generation. Yeah, but that means I have to be out on Sundays and Fridays serving, and I would rather be hey, I want you to give to so-and-so. 
Yeah, but I had plans for that dollar. Hey, I want you to forgive so-and-so, but they are undeserving of it. So now we're in alignment. Who is Lord? Who will trust? And if you want to steward spiritual authority, I'm just saying, you're going to experience this. If you want to grow in spiritual authority, you're going to experience this. So Moses asks the question, who am I? Everybody say, who am I? It's a really honest question. It's the wrong question. The question isn't, who am I? It's who I am is. He just reverses the am and the I. Who am I? No, 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 no. Who is I am? That's just who God said he was. I am. And here he's saying, well, who am I? Hebrew writers put this into, and this is English language, but it, it meshes beautifully in Hebrew as well. And they want you to see the moment God begins to ask you to do something, the next battle you're going to face is that inside of alignment. You're going to experience it. What could it look like in 2024? This is what it looks like for Moses. What does it look like for us in 2024? Well, here's what it's looked like in my life. And I want to be honest with you. I get into seasons like this, and sometimes I don't hear it initially, but I do hear it eventually. Here is what this can sound like. All prayer is good prayer. It is wonderful to ask God. It is wonderful to ask your heavenly father for things. Jesus told us to do it, but pay attention to your prayer. And here's why I say that. Because when we are misaligned, it always sounds like us in inviting Jesus to follow us rather than us saying yes to follow him. God, would you bless me? Would you be with me? Would you be doing this for me? Would you open doors for me? Would you provide for me? Would you do this? And all of that is good. Ask your heavenly father all of those things. Just be careful that the only posture of your life is not you asking Jesus to follow you, but you also saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to say I know what I want you to do in Lori's life. <laughs> and I can talk to you about that. But where are you calling me to go low and to shut up and to die to myself and to lovingly serve so that you can grow my spiritual authority? What are you doing? How are you at work? Some of you have authority so mixed up that you are telling everybody what to do and you need to tell God what it is that you want him to do so that he can tell you what you need to do. And I promise you what you need to do is opposite to what you want to do. I promise you. Quick story. Lori has a spiritual gift of faith and I have the spiritual gift of no. And that's a joke, but not really. In other words, when something comes, Lori says yes immediately and I say no immediately. And we've discovered that about ourselves. And so what we do is Lori says yes, I say no, and then we get together and we pray. Because it's not really about her yes or my no, it's about God, what have you asked us to do? And so we were in Calgary and the landline in the hotel rang, which is odd. Um, you know, some of you don't even know what those are. Um, but the landline rang, and it was a gentleman who's in his you know, late 60s, early 70s, which made sense, no disparaging remark, just made sense why he used the landline. Um, and he picked it up, and he called our room, and he just said, I, he, he, I, I want to meet you. And again, I'm immediately like, no. And Laurie is, yes. So we prayed, and we just felt like, okay, let's do it. We felt the Lord say, yes, do it. And we met with him, and he leads an organization in Canada called CityServe. And CityServe partners with this other company you may have heard of called Amazon. And we were in Calgary, right? We were there and picked up this landline, and then we begin to pray. And where we are today is God says, chase it. And we say, yes which made a lot of work for Pastor Gabe. Because on the other side of your yes, listen, on the other side of your yes, it feels like work, problems, and challenges. When I say yes to God's will for my life, it's going to feel like work, problems, and challenges constantly. Okay? That's not that you're not doing. If you want to do anything worth doing, work, problems, and challenges. By the way, Work problems and challenges are why leaders are necessary. Whenever you don't have those, you don't need leadership. 
Every time I come in, there's work problems and challenges. I'm like, I have job security. <laughs> so here's Moses. He next faces Pharaoh in the Red Sea. He receives the Ten Commandments, only to find the people worshiping a golden calf. As God forms us, we mistakenly believe, oh, I didn't finish the story. We said yes to City Serve. <laughs> and then together uh, as Life Center and all of our campuses over the last year, God has saw fit to entrust to us to give away into our community $1.5 million worth of goods wow. into the city. Amazing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so when you see Pastor Gabe or you see Nenmin or you see Julie, give them a big hug because they are working out work problems and challenges. But as God forms us, we often mistakenly believe postures of surrender and alignment lead to success, but they don't. Okay, this sounds like it's getting worse. It's not. But it leads to brokenness. And, and listen to me. Brokenness is not woundedness. It's not, I'm not talking about woundedness. Okay? I'm talking about something different. As Moses is coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments in hand, what is the first thing he sees? The children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. Yes? Yeah. Question, where did they get the gold from? Egypt. Egypt. And what does Moses have a moment of realization? He has a moment of brokenness realizing that he cannot do what God is asking him to do. Brokenness is, I'm not talking about woundedness. That's a different sermon. I am just saying, when you surrender and you align, God will lead you to a place of brokenness. And it sounds like I can't do it. And in that moment before you is a detour. You can't do it or only God can do it through you. And you get to choose which road you take. Brokenness is where God lovingly refines who we rely upon. Do we rely upon our own strength or do we reply, reply, rely on the joy of the Lord that is our strength? In brokenness, God is meant to teach us these two interrelated truths. I can't, but in Christ, I can. And they are, feel like oxymorons, but they are not. I can't, but in Christ, I sure can. You see, the most dangerous thing any Christian leader can be is when they believe that they can. And if any leader gets to the point where they believe they can, guess what happened? God brings them back to the place of surrender. So we are in a precarious place when we think we can, we can without God. And equally, if we think that we can accomplish what God has given us to accomplish without God, Lord, bring us to a place of repentance. And so we grow in spiritual authority by learning dependence. Everybody say dependence. dependence. Dependence on the Holy Spirit. And the posture of brokenness is often when one goes deeper into becoming more like Jesus or they detour into greater dependence on self rather than the leading of the Holy Spirit. God sends the Son and the Son sends the Spirit and the Spirit transforms us by leading us to all that Jesus said and did and then Jesus completes and shows us the Father. This is this interpersonal trinity of the triune God that we worship. One God, three persons, interpersonal. And so God uses the life of Moses to bring them from Egypt to the edge of the promised land and due to his disobedience, he won't finish the journey, but what he does next is pivotal. In humility, Moses is surrendered, he is aligned, and he is broken, and now he is genuinely, last word, he is vulnerable. And I use the word brokenness, not woundedness, very differently, and I use the word vulnerable very different here as well, and I want you to hear it differently. Vulnerable in the sense that the children of Israel need to get to where they are going, even if I'm not the one to lead them there. That what God has spoke is greater than my failure. That it's not where I have leaded that led them, it is who I have raised up. And so vulnerability in the body of Christ is recognizing you're not the hero, you're not the superstar. You don't pretend need the people around you, you need them desperately. And you don't have it as like a cliche, you know it, you know it, you know it, you know it, that I am in need of you as much as you are in need of me. That I am vulnerable 
in the sense that I can't do it alone and I'm not made to do it alone. The posture of vulnerability is I need those who I am called to serve as much or as more than they need me. We don't get into life groups because we want you to have spiritual things to do. We get into life groups and small groups of community where we get to know one another on a little bit deeper level. We do it so that we can be vulnerable and admit we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Vulnerability. So Moses now realizes there's the promised land. God's going to be faithful. I'm not going to get into it. But Joshua, you can. And I want to say this. Because for some of you, God has given you a dream. And I feel this in my soul for some of you. God has given you a dream and you're not going to see it. Because it's not maybe about you seeing it but you are setting somebody else up to step into the dream of your heart that God is going to call you to serve. Loved ones, the move of God in Canada today, we are experiencing from saints who have died and prayed for this, what it is that we are seeing. They may not have saw it, but they sowed into it and we step into it, not because we're all that in a bag of chips, but because of their faithful service because of their vulnerability. Okay, I went over. So Moses raises up Joshua. Finishing well isn't always you stepping in, but it is serving others so that they will step in. That's what finishing well is. Don't look at Moses and go, he didn't finish well. And by the way, there's only one person in the whole Bible who does surrender, alignment, brokenness, and vulnerability perfect, and his name is Jesus. The rest of us are a work in progress. So don't look at Moses and be like, oh my gosh, like he didn't finish well. Excuse me, if he raised up Joshua who, who stepped in, he finished well. He just didn't finish perfectly because Jesus is our better Moses. The story is not be like Moses. It is learn from Moses, be like Jesus. So the posture of vulnerability again is I need those who I'm called to serve so much more than they need me. Let me end here. A positional Christian lives life through the lens of how much you need them. A positional Christian is not transparent with anyone. There's always a secret. A positional Christian chooses distance over relationships. A positional Christian won't allow others into the true space where God is at work in their lives. That is a positional Christian. But a Christ-like Christian lives life through the lens of how much they need others. And it's not false humility. It is evident in their decisions, their behavior, the way in which they choose to do life. A Christ-like Christian is honest with other followers of Jesus. A Christ-like Christian chooses closeness and relationship, even knowing that they're going to get wounded in closeness. A Christ-like Christian, oh, oh, Jesus fell down there. A Christ-like Christian allows others, another, into the place where God is at work in their life. And so the story of Moses is about to end, and the story of Joshua is going to ramp up, but it's forever tied to Moses, whose story is tied to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And so in the Bible, we are about to read this interconnected story, now soon in Joseph, of those who will or will not, but all of the story is this. Here's the four questions. In surrender, God will bring you to a place of who is really in control of your life. In alignment, their question is, who is really following who? Are you asking, are you following, are you asking Jesus to follow you? In brokenness, it is what do you really rely on? Do you rely on yourself? Do you rely on everything that your created hands have made? Or do you rely on God? And vulnerability is the, admission, the admonishment. It is us admitting that we need others to become more like Jesus. And so, Father, be at work in the lives of your church as we, spirit, as we learn to steward spiritual authority. Amen. Amen.